Right to a channel of light fluid. It's time to go far beyond the world. And if you remember where we left things off, we're still waiting on news of Rannoch. I wonder what will happen this time. I wake up with a long, satisfying yawn, as if I had the best night's rest in my life. However, my attention is immediately drawn to a dampness in my crotch. Shit, I had a wet dream. Thank goodness for the loincloth, otherwise I'd ruin the fresh linen. My emotions seem to have a mind of their own, but I need to keep them in check. Pining over Rannoch is one thing, but this... I mean, it's half his damn fault for edging me like this, but considering our conversation, it doesn't feel right to fantasise about him. At least not while we don't know where we stand with each other. He is hot, though. I'll give him that. He knows how to flaunt it. I get up from bed and remove my dirty loincloth, crumpling it up like an improvised tissue. With that in hand, I walk into the kitchen. I hang back the cloak and get some water into the bowl. Very much aware their sense of smell would pick up on any irregularity, I wash myself thoroughly with the bar of soap. I definitely do not want to have that a conversation. Especially after Varissa's vivid description of their sex life. I also washed a loincloth of my shame, removing all evidence of my accidental release. I slushed a gist of water out of the window and take a deep breath. I feel so repentant, almost as if I did something bad and I didn't even masturbate. Can't imagine how I'd feel if I did. Perhaps now I'll be able to keep my head straight. To my surprise, I'm not visited in the morning, but I have enough nibbles around to scrounge up a decent breakfast. Mindful of what I was told the other night, I stay inside, impatiently observing the doors in hope that someone would come to visit. But hours pass, and I'm still alone. My chin slides from its comfortable perch in the palm of my hand and I'm stirred back up. I blink the bright light of early afternoon and look around. Still, no visitors. This begins to worry me, as it means that the elders are setting the entire village on edge. They're coming for you! I feel my heart sink, but only momentarily. If that were the case, if they indeed were about to arrest me or execute me, it's not like I'd be able to do anything about it. Besides, there's no proof of this. I trust Varissa's plan. She's a fool! I promise to God I will make a copy of that damn tattoo if only to shut you up. Good. Means you can listen. I take a deep sigh and look around the room. I've cleaned everything thrice over already. This house would make Cinderella's stepmother stop a bitching. Not a speck of dirt to be found anywhere. I completely out of things to do, and as always when I'm idle, the shadows become chatty. I'm not about to entertain this any more. I simply grab the different books lying around the house and bring them to the table. There's five of them in total. The Tiger Rebellion, Six Tribes of Tiernan, Brief History of Freyfall, Avis Guide to the Culinary Delights of Avalan, huh, a cookbook of sorts. I flip through the pages, seeing recipes for a whole plethora of dishes. They seem to be organised by regions, and as I skim through I notice that some pages are marked with a folded corner. I ruffle through the book until I arrive at such a spot be greeted by the chapter's big lettering, Staples of Freyfall. Freyfall, more so than any other region of Tigeron, is infused with the dietary habits of humankind. The food here is robust, and usually accompanied by a selection of root vegetables, steamed, boiled or sautéed. In this chapter you shall find all sorts of pastry, bread and pie recipes, as well as a good assortment of stews and casseroles. 
As in my treatise on the Heartland Cuisine, you'll find, my dear reader, that humans and tigers have one other thing in common. Their sweet tooth. So rest assured that your selection of desserts will be mightily enriched by the end of this chapter. So Rana could use this to learn what to feed me? Huh. I smile, realising how exciting this must have been for him. He found a creature none of his kin have ever seen. I bet those were the very few, if not THE first books he actually read in his whole life. All to get to know me. He makes his appearance at the foot of my bed the very first night, that much more understandable. I flip through the remaining pages, and true to a word, Avis describes various stews, pies, and even a few different bread variations. Page with a sourdough recipe is also marked with a fold. I can imagine him sitting here, going through the books late into the night, trying to understand how to accommodate me better, while taking curious glances at the bedroom door. I look back towards the bed, almost able to see myself lying there unconscious. My vision blurs, I'm getting slightly emotional, I rub my eyes clear. I miss that damn wolf so much. I close the book, realising it doesn't help me to exactly steady myself. The last and smallest of tomes is a booklet no bigger than the personal notebook, and it seems to be just that. Ailments, injuries and curses. It seems to be some sort of medical diary made by a doctor who described different diseases and injuries he encountered, leaving a detailed account of how to treat them. There are some wacky parts where the male describes various curses he battled with. And like with the cookbook, this one doesn't have any marks, so it seems it wasn't much of use to Rannoch. I mean, I turned out not to be injured. If I were well, they wouldn't have known that unless I woke up. As for curses... I laughed at my own stupidity, but I decided to entertain a wild thought. I skimmed through various curses, trying to find any involved in hearing voices. But it doesn't seem to be a serious treaty on the matter. Most curses described here are of benign nature, like being cursed with bad luck or a curse of spoilage, which supposedly rots away all the food in the household within a day. Witchy, hacky nonsense. I tossed a tome aside, pretty much losing my interest in it. It's no much for killing time. I dart my eyes back to the six tribes of Tien and decide to give it another skim. Not much newfound information apart from the last page. At the very end, missed by me on the first read, there's a little map of the entire region. I gaze at it curiously, seeing different tribes noted on the parchment with their main settlements marked with a circled point. I guess this village is quite deep in the woods. I look towards the northern border with Gul'diran. That's where the Vortigern wolf rules. If, if what Vol said is true and it took Rannoch three days to get there, how big is this forest? How much distance can a person cover in a day? Twenty, thirty miles? I'm spitballing here, but if my estimates anywhere near the correct answer, that would make the border almost a hundred miles away. That can't be right, can it? I look back at the map and measure the width and length of the entire region. It's at least ten times that east to west, and six times north to south. That's like a thousand miles by six hundred. It would make this forest huge, at least the size of a big country, which makes me even more confused about how I ended up here. I really can't be recall being in the forest to begin with. In fact, the harder I think about it, the more I'm convinced that anything began in this cottage. Waking up in that bed was the first lucid moment of my existence here. Which means that whatever my life was before waking up here, it was out of this world. I don't belong here. Whatever brought me here wiped my mind clean of any memories, but there are echoes of things resonating in the void. I can feel it with every fibre of my being, but just as before, the very idea of it filled me with dread. This time around, I feel rather encouraged by the concept. This feels like an adventure very few are given the chance to undertake, and the choice being made for me, all I can really do is revel in it. It does leave only one question. Why me? What's so special about me? Nothing! You are nothing! It takes one to no one. I mean, it is rich coming from the ephemeral whisper. 
At this moment you're basically a cosmic fart. You even linger around like one. Mm -hmm. You don't like that, do you? I can sense its anger at being dismissed so easily. Two of us can play this game. You're just a pawn. And you're meant to be the player? I mean, manipulating my emotions might have worked if you're a tiny bit more subtle with it. But now I know there's something wrong with me. I know you're there, whoever you are. I mean, I might be just mad, but considering I'd rather stay on the hopeful side of things, I'll go along with you being real. Which means I'm possessed. I shrug. Normally I'd probably freak out at such a realisation, but considering I've woken up to a bunch of werewolves, got stabbed, and now at best face a threat of war and execution at worst, condescending whispers are somewhat low on my list of worries. Damn. I guess Wall might have been right about that blood ritual. Whoever was scurrying about those woods in the dead of night was up to no good. I'm just wondering if I was the means or the ends. Once Ranlock returns, I'll have to get this properly discussed with the group. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I wave my hand dismissively. Save it to someone who cares, buddy. I'm seriously done with you for now. With the sun setting, I set up a fire and continue my vigil, but there's still no visit. The night grows darker and the shadows grow longer, forcing me to consider simply calling it a day. I am somewhat unsettled by being left alone, or it's not like I'm without any provisions, so I can't complain. I just hope whatever the reason for Vols and V's absence is, it doesn't bide more trouble for us. My stress levels are high enough as it is. Finally, completely defeated, I put out the fire, grab the cloak and head to bed. Being bored out of my wits, it doesn't take me long, long for me to drift off, especially snuggling into the crumpled cloak. A knocking on the window wakes me up. I rub my eyes lazily, noticing it's still night. I approach a sill, my numb fingers fiddling with the latch for a moment until I finally manage to unlock the window and open it ajar. To my surprise, I find Varissa standing outside between the lines of our laundry. I half expected Voldry to be at our first night's encounter. I hope everything's all right. I mutter, still rubbing my eyes. Well, yes and no. I draw a deep sigh of defeat. Of course, why did I expect anything else? The elders were wasting half our day interrogating everyone about you and Rannoch. While the other half was wasted at the villa when the chief summoned us to a question about the elders. What a palaver. Uh, yeah, uh, whatever that means. So that's why you're away today. Yes, yeah, sorry about that. Both me and Vol were held up and I didn't want to endanger Cora further. Endanger her? I blink, slightly confused. Didn't she tell you she also was interrogated, maybe about the food and who's paying for it? Oh yeah, she did mention that. Well, Vitha didn't like it one bit, so he forbade Cora from getting involved with you. Damn. I mumble, saddened by the news. I mean, he's doing what any father would do. He's trying to protect her. I'm glad you choose to see it that way. Uh, speaking of... She slides a fragrant linen parcel onto the sill, as I infer it to find a quiche in a collection of fruit pastries. Is this from Vitha, then? Nope, he's still at the villa. Then there's only one other person that could have made these. I state plainly, watching her smile. So much for not getting involved with me, eh? I chuckle, putting off a piece of the quiche and stuffing it into my mouth. I'm not starved or anything, but I was going on throughout the day on just the nipples. Cora is quite independent, and she took a liking to you. The feeling is mutual. I smile, enjoying the deliciously moist quiche. This little gift immediately lifts my mood. I see there's more to come as Verissa's practically beaming with a very impatient smirk. What? I've got some good news for you. Oh, I could use some. Rannoch's coming back. I stop, gaping at her in disbelief. How do you know? We heard it over the howl. The howl, or...? I know, it's a bit confusing. She brushes it off with a chuckle. Our actual howls convey short messages that can be heard over quite some distance, especially out in the open. Yeah, Rannoch said something to that effect. 
I see your smirk intensify. Oh, he did more than just say it, didn't he? She lets the question hang for a moment. Quite a lot of us could hear his little demonstration. I blush slightly, reminded of our evening together. Yeah, I might have pushed him to it. Anyway, one of the outer sentries passed on the howl he overheard. Rannoch's just a day away. He should be around here tomorrow evening. I cover my lips and jump up with joy like a little kid who just had his wish granted. Oh, God, yes! I exclaim, causing the female to shush me. Sorry, just, I was so worried. I try to control the waterworks as my eyes begin to gloss. It's fine, just be happy, but quietly. So, did he find the missing packs? Well, he only found one of them. What about the other? That's the mystery you'll have to solve tomorrow. Her voice slightly wavers. But the silver line is that Regara's pack is all accounted for. And considering their pace, it seems that none of them are seriously injured. Yeah, that is a relief. Suck it, you fucking liar. Anyway, tomorrow's going to be quite busy. There's a lot of preparation to do. The chief wants to throw a proper feast to welcome the pack, but... She pauses, giving me a surprisingly comforting smile. Since you're Rannoch's ward, your place will be at his side, at the table, won't it? My expression lightens at an excited tone. I'm looking forward to that. Is there anything I can do to help? Oh, not particularly, no. Am I under house arrest, then? I suppose not. She sounds hesitant. Aldris and Dran did their digging, so they most lay ahead of my hair for a while. If you have some errands to run, feel free, just... You know. Yeah, don't cuddle up to every wolf I meet. I laugh out. He can be taught. She jokes and is about to depart when a thought strikes me. Um, Marissa? Yes? I actually have a favour to ask of you. It's about Rannoch. I was wondering if there's anything he likes to eat that he doesn't get to enjoy often at the feasts. A cheeky devil? She smiles, giving me one of her telling gazes. No, it's not like that. It's just, he's working so hard to accommodate me here, spoiling me with food all this time. I just would like to do something meaningful to return the favour. There is something that would make his heart melt. Really? I almost blurt out excitedly, and she smirks again in that teasing fashion. Come on, just tell me. Very well. Rannoch has a sweet tooth. Always had. When we were pups, our den mother used to prepare pork with apples and mustard. Rannoch couldn't have enough of it. Ever since she joined the ancestors, I haven't seen the dish around. Not many of us like fruit with their meat. Hmm, that sounds quite complicated. Oh, not at all, it's a simple dish. I can give you the instructions. I frown in slight apprehension. If you know how to make it, can you help me? I thought the whole point of this was for you to do something meaningful for him. My involvement would make this moot, No. I guess you're right. I can see, though my expression still betrays reluctance. I'm sure you can manage a simple recipe. I mean, I can try, so how do I go about making this dish? It's all quite simple. You even make it in one skillet. She says with the confidence of a salesperson. First, you wedge one apple and fry it up in a little in some butter, till it's nice and golden and the juices create a glaze. But as with every sales pitch, there's an asterisk, which I can immediately spot. It's spring. Where would I get an apple? Oh, yeah, you're right. The confidence wavers, but only for a moment, and the female snaps her fingers. I know, there should be some dried slices at the villa. They use them for punches and such. You could just soak them in water and then fry them up. I'm even allowed to go there. I don't see why not. She shrugs. Especially if you keep to the bunnies, I doubt anyone would even notice. Besides, you're Rannoch's ward. If you're spotted, just say his name and you should be left alone. I mean, you are doing it for him anyway. Yeah, good point. I nod, actually confident this could work. Despite the possible risk, I'd like to at least try, if just to do it for him. So, once I soak and fry the apples, what then? Then you fry the pork in the glaze until it's golden brown. Once that's then you add a cup of broth, some sage and a dollop of mustard. When it boils up a bit, you add back the apples and finish it up with a dash of cream and let it stew. As I said, it's all quite easy. 
I tried to make a solid mental note of the recipe. Soak the apples, fry them in butter. Remove the apples, fry the pork, add a cup of broth, some sage and mustard, then a dash of cream. Yeah, I think I can manage that. I finally nod in agreement. Really, Sam, you can cook a stew and make some sausages. You can cook this. I have faith in you. I assume I could get all of that at the villa. Yeah, they cook meat every day there, so it's always some broth around. Okay, thanks for your help. No problem. She smiles happily. It's a lovely idea. I'm sure Ranak will appreciate it. A perfect welcome home gesture. I'm glad you think so. Sweet dreams. The female waves and walks off. Sleep well when you do. I call out shutting the window and returning to bed. Considering my impatience at seeing my wolf, I'm very happy to know I've most of the day organised. I guess I'll go to the villa straight in the morning to get all the ingredients ready. I'm sure Vol will be more than happy to give me some cuts for Anok. Yep, tomorrow's going to be a great day. And with that thought, I snuggle into my blankie, taking last sniffs of my Rannoch substitute. Tomorrow I'll have the real deal beside me. As I drift off, I'm trying to recall the recipe to make sure it'll stay with me when I wake up. Fry some apples in the butter? No. First soak the apples. Remove the apples and fry pork in the glaze. Add some broth and sage and mustard. I wake up, wake up invigorated by the idea of seeing Rannoch after this arduous week. I mean, I'm not going to complain. I'm sure trudging through the woods to reach his missing packs was much more an adventure than me serving one lunch at his dad's place. But still, today we're out of the limbo. Whatever his decision is, I just want to brave this storm with him at my side. Romance or no romance. He's perfect the way he is. Just a good friend. Anything else is an added bonus. As I rub my tired face, trying to collect myself the task ahead, something odd occurs to me. There's no stubble. In fact, as I glide my hand across the chin and cheeks, there's not a single hair to be found. Come to think of it, my fingernails are the exact same length as they were on the first day. It's been nearly two weeks. Surely I would have grown both the beard and nails. It almost feels as if I'm not aging here, like a freaking elf. I chuckle it off, getting up to my feet. If within a month my hair will remain the same length, I'll have my confirmation. I don't suppose any of the wolves would find this remotely of interest. One, they're not familiar with humans, and two, they're covered with fur head to toe. Good luck explaining facial hair. But at least I now know there is definitely something wrong with me. Whispers, accelerated healing, multilingual abilities, and now this. At this point I'm hardly surprised by anything. Perhaps it's not the best reaction to a possibility that one somehow drank from the Fountain of Youth, but considering the wacky hijinks happening so far, I'd rather limit the number of abnormalities I have to focus on. Either way, today is about Rannoch, not about my possible superpowers. I rush to the kitchen and notice that, just as they predicted, the dandelion doesn't look too jazzy. I wonder if maybe, as before, a bit of sun wouldn't re reinvigorate it. Enough at least to survive until Rannoch's arrival. Yes, I think I'll take it with me. Once I'm washed and dressed, I secure the flower on my pin, grab the basket from my shopping list and get ready to step outside. Just though I'm about to leave, I remember Vol's advice and decide to take his token with me as well, just in case. Having no pockets, I simply slide it behind my collar to rest snugly between my skin and the leather strap. My, what a wonderful day. The birds are chirping, the sun is shining, the warm breeze gently caresses my skin through the airy silk. Everything is perfect in the world, just as it should be on such a joyous day. With a happy gait, I march onto the path and head towards the village, merrily bobbing the basket side to side. As I do so, I begin to chuckle, realising that my white dress and blue shawl are very much akin to Dorothy's outfit, so I decide to do her skip. One, two, shuffle. One, Two shuffle. And uh, I'm off to see the wizard, the wonderful wizard of Oz. I hear he is a wizard of Oz, if ever a wizard there was. If ever, oh, ever a wizard there was, the wizard of Oz is one because, 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 because. Because of the. What is the meaning of this? Oh shit. Contrary to Verissa's prediction, Aldris and Dran are very much on the prowl. They rush towards me as if I were a fire. 
Rice is savage and supervised. Uh, complete lunacy. She grabs my arm harshly and pulls to the side, causing me to nearly trip. Scamper through the towns he just accomplished some mischief. I'm trying not to resist, but she's pushing and shoving me every which way. It very much feels as if I'm struggling against her. Be still, you pathetic whelp. Thinking I'm putting up a fight, the fat so drops his pipe and rushes to grab my other hand. I become the proverbial rope in a tug of war. He's a wieldy. He howls I'm getting more and more panicked. I'm doing nothing. It's just those two idiots pulling me in the opposite directions. I can't stop yelps escaping my lips. So they squeeze harder, putting pressure on my muscle and bone. As their laboured breaths intensify and I finally hear a growl, I want to shout out for help. Before I've managed to do so, I hear Cora's melodic voice come out from the bakery. What are you doing? What is this commotion all about? Mind your own business and leave this to us. The pudgy female spits out, where I can see Cora's ready in a fight or flight mode. Her entire fur is standing upright and her neck looks incredibly electrified. This is my business. Your friendly screeching could even make a sourdough go flat. We found this mongrel fooling around unsupervised, probably looking to steal. Where are the guards? Leave him alone. She demands, physically pushing the male off of me. He's not doing anyone any harm. Get your paws off of him. A growl is now directed at Aldridge, who's clutching, me, clutching at me for a dear life. How dare you speak to us like that? Leave him be. He's simply running errands. Errands? Ah, he's a savage. He's running them for my father. The confidence in her voice even got me confused. The other two have no means of asserting is a lie. As the chief's advisor, he outranks you both. So unpour him, you vile woman. She bumps into the female, trying to put her off of me. You pesky little bitch! I... Last time I saw you hit a pup, I let you off with a warning. But should you do it again? Included with this one, I will name you, woman. I've never seen her this determined. Her fury rivals that of all. Cora can be scary when she needs to. It's clear her threat made Aldrich step back, finally releasing my abused arm. Why, you... Rand shakes his clenched fist, squaring off the tiny female, but she stands defiantly. She even moves her chin closer to him, narrowing her eyes in a challenging stare. Go on, touch me, I dare you. She sneers in contemptuous tone. Just lay your paw on me and give me a reason to slit your throat where you stand. I didn't even notice when she pulled out a small dagger from underneath her skirt. Dran also did not see that coming, judging by his complete shock. Why, I never. Well, now you have. Cora mocks him and sweeps her arm around me in a protective gesture. I feel both petrified by those old lunatics and entirely taken by her defiance. Mark my word, Missy, I can make your life extremely difficult. Or it's not like you've been making it easy thus far. She scoffs, looking at me with a weak smile. Come, pet. We haven't finished. Well, I have. Listen, Joe, you're impudent. What is going on here? Aldris was about to continue the spat when both she and Dran jump out of Vol's sudden appearance. Thank God for him. Oh, nothing unusual. Cora rolls her eyes, still very much tightly embracing me, drawing Vol's attention to my abused arms. I caught this old hag dragging another young lin across the street. How dare you! He's bruised. He states with a voice completely devoid of any humour, then his empty gaze lands on the old-timers. Don't you have your own work to attend to? I know, but I've closed down the shop, so every day is a troop of clowns in town. Both the old wolves nearly choke on the remark, taking deep, aggravated huffs of air. You think our moon so protects you, boy? Are you all right, Piglet? I'm talking to you. But Vol is very much intent on ignoring him, taking a gentle hold of my arm and inspecting it carefully. It's slightly bruised with purplish imprints where their paws held me. He closes his eyes, taking a deep sigh and then turns idly towards Dran. The male is slightly startled, but Vol doesn't move or even says anything. He just glares at the old male. Wait, what's this? Aldris draws our collective attention. She kneels next to me and picks up something shiny from the ground. Ah, I knew he was stealing. 
she exclaimed in satisfaction, waving a silver coin in front of Vol's muzzle. It's your token. Where do you get it, you little thief? Duran tries to rush me, but Vol blocks him with his, ex- his extended paw. Most likely when he took him to the butchery, he ransacked it. Thief? He is not a thief. Vol letters quietly. He's oddly calm and it unsettles me. No, not calm. He's emotionless. I gave it to him. What, have you lost your mind? Why do you do such a thing? Because he earned it. He shrugs, lowering his arm and snatching the coin from the female. How? Oh, it's a very funny story and completely none of your business. What? My tokens are my affair. I don't have to explain my dealings to anyone. Listen here, you overgrown pup. With a simple shove, Vol sends Drand out to the dirt and the rounded male bounces a few times on his rump. Aldris tries to help a friend when the black wolf addresses her with his empty voice. Ah, Grandma Val doing? I haven't spoken with her in a while. You damn brat, how you dare lay your paws on me? Oh, perhaps I should invite her for a visit. He raises his brow with a pudgy female and she fidgets slightly. Rand scrambles to his legs, glaring at her with growing anger. I will have your... Rand, shut up and let's go. The female interrupts him, grimacing uncomfortably. What, you're going to ignore this? We've got more important things to attend to. She nearly growls, casting a nasty gaze at Vol and giving each of us a taste. As she leaves, Rand decided to slam his shoulder into the black wolf. But instead of achieving his desired effect, he bounces back like a bumper car, causing me to snort. How is this lunatic still alive? First he starts with Ritha, now Vol. Oh, plenty of eyes about. This will become a talking point in the next few feasts. Better let's get, better let's get off the road. Hmm. Vol murmurs, locking his red irises with me. Cora leads us into the bakery. Before I can buy their cosy domicile, Vol grabs my arm sternly and start, snarls at me. What the fuck, Piglet? You're supposed to stay put. I almost blurt out a protest when Cora does it for me. He was just walking down the road. How more put could he possibly be? Well, as much as it would take to keep those two out of our hair. But then, the only acceptable other kin being put is in a box six feet under. She sneers in annoyance, drawing a reluctant laugh from the black male. His gaze softens, and he darts his eyes between the rattled female and me. Are you two okay? Oh, as okay as one can be. She mutters through her clenched teeth, and finally lets out a long sigh of relief. Oh, sorry. Uh, thanks, Vol. She places the paw on his shoulder, causing the male's tail to give a flick. I don't know what would have happened if you didn't intervene. Oh, don't worry. He tries to act it cool. Well, that's got to have a clear view of this street, eh? What do they want with him? I don't know. I was just making dough and I heard the shouting, and here they were, abusing him. Hmm. He croons, rubbing the top of his head. He's clearly troubled. Things are going to get interesting once Ronak is back. I doubt those will disappear before tonight. The wolf nods towards the purple spots on both my arms. Ah, oh, fucking shit show. Yeah, you lost it. He resents me with his coin, and I take it with slight embarrassment. He understands us, doesn't he? What? She catches us by surprise, we both give her a startled look. I'm not dumb, Vol. I've seen you and, and Varissa interact with him in ways you never did with any of the bunnies. I always want to facepalm, but instead I simply exchange an inquisitive gaze with Vol. I'm not going to betray you. You cannot tell anyone. The black wolf states plainly, to which she takes clear offence. Of course. Not even your father. Do I look stupid? She scoffs. I don't tell him anything. He's a chatty drunk. Good, because Rannock's life hinges on this remaining a secret. Have you sure any future with him? I have my own mind and heart, thank you very much, and so does Rannock. She brushes him off. If he sticks his neck out for the human, so shall I. Fuck, oh, I hate this. Wool grumbles in annoyance, pacing around the room while she comes closer and takes hold of my shoulders. 
I hope you won't mind. You won't keep my earlier behaviour against me. I didn't mean to be patronising. Oh, not at all. I'm actually relieved I can speak to you freely. I really appreciate anything you've done for me this far. It was nothing. The female looks a bit uncomfortable, but only for a moment, casting her eyes to Vol, who's still pace, pacing anxiously. My, it is startling to see another can speak as fluently as one of your own, isn't it? Hmm. Well, it's a pleasure to make your acquaintance, Pet. She musters a polite smile, her attention keeps drifting to the, to the pacing male. But we have something far worse to worry about. Those two geezers are not going to be happy about it, especially now since you've intervened. Seeing you involved in the human, they'll start suspecting something. That bridge is already burned. Drown was asking me about that dress the other day. Why, what's it got to do with you? Cora seems thrown off. I bought it. You bought it? She tries to subdue a mocking tone. Oh, Marissa, obviously. Finally, Cora cannot help herself and erupts in laughter. Whatever made you buy her a dress? Did you hear me? I'm the one shadows the pedal. You don't see me strutting around the town in the latest Lagari fashions. It was a miscalculation. I say. She laughs once more. A miscalculation needs some actual thinking process behind it. Uh, this was more of a hit and miss. Yes, yes, thank you for your insight. That's exactly why I ended up on Piglet. He waves his paw in my direction, he bl she blinks. Piglet? Uh, that would be me. I smile, raising my hand shyly. Why you call him that? He's got a name, doesn't he? What's your name, pet? Sam. A lovely. She smiles wide and looks to the black wolf. See, wasn't that hard? Ugh. I'll call it whatever the fuck I please. I've been taking care of that needy little bitch for nearly two weeks now. I don't need schooling from a part-time nanny. I'm not sure if he's insulting her daycare duties or her brief involvement with me. Or both. No involvement. He's doing both, isn't he? Seriously. She crosses her arms in annoyance. But I don't want this dragged out. I place my hand on his shoulder and give her a confident smile. I don't mind, really. We've got more important problems than Vol's personal charm. She snorts at my comment and shakes her head. Oh yes, you're quite right. Since we just told off two of the elders, I suggest we disperse. I have the pups to look after and you've got your butchery to run. She nods at Vol when her eyes land on me. I assume that whatever your activity was, it's still very much pending. Uh, yes, I was gathering ingredients for Ranok. I just don't know if it's a good idea now. Oh, pish posh. You're not a prisoner, otherwise you'd be in the stockades. You're Ranok's ward. She pokes the crest on my collar. If you need things for him, you go about your business. Don't let anyone strong arm you. Those two act like they own the damn place, but they don't. I hear Vol's strained grumble in the back. He's clearly getting agitated. Ah. Uh. You have my coin. Just show it if any of the guards give you trouble. Just don't lose it next time. I'm sorry, I won't. I mumble apologetically, patting my dress. I don't have any pockets, so I just get rid of my collar. It must have slipped. Will rolls his eyes in annoyance, while Cora bobs happily as if struck with an idea. Oh, that's easily sorted. The female quickly rushes to the back of the room, rummaging in the cupboard. She quickly returns with a small leather pouch. Here you go, love. You can tie it to your belt and use it to store trinkets. I look at the embroidered borders, with a simple Celtic knot motif in the middle. It's beautiful. Are you sure? Of course. Ranok gave it to me on my 16th moon day, but I never really used it. Seems they both missed their marks with gifts, huh? I slowly become a repository for unwanted knickknacks. I jest, tying the pouch to my waistline and causing Cora to laugh. They try, bless him. But at the end, it's the thought that counts. He made it himself, you know. Oh? I muttered, depositing Vol's coin into the pouch and looking at it with renewed admiration. It very much seems like a work of a professional craftsman. You'll be so glad to see it on you, I'm sure. Yeah, I hope so. 
My smile slightly wavers as I take a discreet glance towards the street. I feel quite defeated. Ronald left me just a week and I managed to fuck up our little secret without even trying. As nice as Cora is, this wasn't part of the plan. And then there's Tano. As expected, a female picks up on my shift and looks at me with a worried expression. Well, I'm sorry, we cannot be in any more help, love. No, I protest. You've been absolutely brilliant. It's just... I sigh, casting my uncomfortable gaze towards the path. Those two, and a few others, really scared of living soul out of me. Oh, see the wolf's den. You cannot be a sheep here. I raise my brown surprise, immediately drawn back to Anel's analogy. We'll make a wolf out of you yet. She corrects my dress and unfurls my shawl, which got tangled in the spat. Right, I'll escort him to the square. Great, so I actually need some meat. Good, so we all know what to do. Cora smiles in agreement and walks behind the counter to a workstation. I'll be seeing you later, pet, and we'll have some catching up to do. I'm looking forward to it. Not as much as I do. As we step outside, Vol stops for a moment and takes a deep breath. He holds it for a while and I feel slightly worried. You're okay? Oh, I'm fine, I just... He cuts off, throwing his gaze towards Ranok's cottage in the forest. I told that idiot not to get involved, that we get in too deep. Now I'm practically drowning in this bullshit. I feel a little uneasy at his comment, but he decided to touch his arm to reassure him, only to have it brushed off. Not in public, Piglet. He grumbles and finally moves towards his shop. Despite Vol's notoriety, every single eye is drilled into us. The fishmonger sorts his fish, but his eyes are hooked into my flesh like a fishing pole. Even the blacksmith calls out a curse as he hammers his finger due to his strained gaze. Every wolf passing by or work in their shop looks at us intently. For fuck's sake! Vol nearly snarls in anger and I can see his fur bristle. Once at the butcher, his paw grabs my neck and he shoves me into the back room. Before I get to say anything, his paws, paws slam on either side as he pins me to the wall. What the fuck were you doing, you idiot? I I was... Well, I saw you skipping through the town, almost begging for someone to thrash you. His angered maw snapped in front of me, and his jagged fangs, st- fangs start to affect my heart rate. I, I, I was happy. Happy to get killed? You're fucking useless, not even Cora knows. Uh, I'm sorry, I... Man up, piglet. He shakes me hard and shoves me to the floor. This isn't the playground. You're literally fucking with our lives here. My breath speeds up and I begin to hyperventilate. At first I think it's another panic attack brought on by his anger. But now I realise I'm not scared. I'm angry. Not even angry. I'm furious. Always a pushover. Fuck off. I shout out, locking my exasperated gaze with startled eyes. I get up to my feet and look at him, utterly fed up. I was happy because Ranok's coming back. He's the only person I can trust or rely on this loony bin. I'm done with him treated like a fucking hostage. I try to shove him, but the wolf doesn't budge even an inch. I cannot wait for the day when I finally get to leave this fucking shithole full of fucking maniacs. I finish my rant, my rattled chest rising and falling in quick succession, but Vol seems unimpressed. You're done. I allow myself a few more huffs of air before exhaling resignation. I am done with everything. I exhale pitifully, again feeling my emotions spiral out of my control. I can feel the entity push against my psyche. It takes all the strength I have not to break. So much for my bluster. I'm so done. No, you're not. He mutters, closing his eyes. What? It's called releasing pent up anger. You're just coming down from a high. What the fuck is he talking about? All I ever saw you do is fall into pieces and cry or freeze up like a bunny stand to a wolf's jaw. It's good to see you processing some anger as well. There's plenty of it there, I'm sure. I gave it him, completely lost in his train of thought. Is that what it is, that fucking therapy? I mock him, snark clear in my voice. Maybe not the type you want, but definitely the one you need. He shrugs. 
But if Cora found out, that means others are on to you as well. She's not dumb, you know. She found out because of you. She even said to herself. I protest, but he simply scoffs. Yes, and why do you think that is? It's because we had a collie like a damned suckling since you constantly cry for a tit. You know what? I don't give a shit. I raise my hands in resignation. I just wanted to do something nice for Rallock to welcome him home. I don't have time to go through this with you again. Either you'll help me or not. Have you do what? He asks in confusion. Pork with apples and mustard. His eyes open wide. He looks as if he's seen a ghost. How do you know about that? Does it matter? The wolf closes his eyes and sighs in resignation. This is rich. I bet Marissa told you. He mutters uncomfortably. How else would you know it's his favourite dish? Why does it matter? I really just need the porkful. I state calmly. I don't want to argue or be lectured or to apologise for something that isn't my fault. The wolf gives me a confused look, but eventually concedes to a sigh, walks towards one of the shelves, taking up a large slab of meat. He slams it on the table, in silence cuts out four nice fillets. As he places them gently into my basket, he gives me a somewhat confusing look. It's not indifferent and not sad, just off. Yeah, I'll enjoy it, I'm sure. Even his voice sounds subdued. What's going on? Ah, oh, fuck, why do I have to be an emotional support blanket? You're all over the place. I state plainly, stopping him as he's about to leave the shop front. You're dead emotionless when facing those old pricks and acting all cool and nice in front of Cora, then nearly attacking me again. What the fuck for? I demand and I see his ears flop slightly. I didn't want to get involved, but I did, for him. Now everyone gets involved, everyone fawns over a fucking human. It's like you're some sort of psychedelic drug, making everyone abandon their senses, senses and cry for more. He speaks calmly and slowly, but it's spied out with calm appearance. I can sense he's seething inside. They're just trying to help. Well, they're trying to get killed. He finally snaps, locking his anger gaze with me, and I can see his form tense. Standing up those two is suicidal. When I saw him hustle with you, I thought, good, I'll teach him. But Cora had to run out, eager to pick a fight she couldn't win. She's more than capable. He's eager to dismiss anyone who's smaller than him, but she has shown her fangs. If she had harmed them in any way, she would have been banished, whatever Vitter's position might be. And once that happened, he would definitely thank an appropriate measure the creature that caused it. I had to intervene, not only for yours, but for her sake as well. Losing one idiot was bad enough, but two of them would break Ranok. Is that the only reason why you did it? Everything I do is for that idiot. He reiterates angrily. I was hoping I wouldn't have to throw myself in front of the elders this early. They didn't even find out you can speak yet. Fuck. He growls, grabbing his head, and his entire demeanour collapses. I can hear his breath getting more irregular. As much as I thought it was just frustration, now I can see that it's not. His tail is tucked in. He's scared. I've seen how much his emotions are shifting from one extreme to the next. He doesn't know how to process it. It must be literally the first time in his life when he was actually scared. It's okay. I speak softly, but not approach. I know how volatile he can be. Nothing's okay. Everything's turning to shit. You dealt with him pretty well. No. I didn't. I had to get Gran involved. Your Gran? I blink, completely thrown off. As in your grandma? No, as in my fucking trained monkey named Gran. He sneers in annoyance. Of course my grandma, you idiot. Wait, Val. Have a quick think. You mean Valris is your grandmother? How the fuck do you know that? He looks at me completely stumped, and I must admit, it feels nice when dots start to connect, but... Oh. Oh, no. It means you're related to Aldris. Sit on my grandmother is hardly any relation. He scoffs uncomfortably, almost as if it were an insult. I mean, it kind of is. It's relation enough to make that old bitch uneasy. She was practically speechless. Again, how the fuck do you know about Val? Enel mentioned her at the villa, and Aldris nearly, nearly blew a gasket. I just filled in the gaps. I shrug and Volux into the distance. 
My gran and Nell are very close. Aldris, uh, not so much. I don't think anything is physically capable of being close with that winch. Unless she and Drang. Yeah. I'm sure I'm pulling Cora's hippy jibby's expression right now. Anyway, I don't think you have to worry about anything. The threat worked. You have no idea who those two are. Bull replies coldly, giving me a condescending look. They're the pettiest, most backhanded pieces of shit this side of Tiernan. They won't let this slide. They'll start working their case against all of us now. He mutters coldly, embracing himself in an oddly comforting way. I start to think this is serious. You really are worried. Of course I'm fucking worried. He sneers at me. They're already building one case against Ramlock and you. Now they'll work on one against Cora and me. This is why I have to get my grandma involved. The black wolf sighs heavily and locks his gaze with the floor. I have to be prepared in case there'll be a howl invoked. I nearly choke in confusion. Wait, what? Why would there be a howl invoked? Depending on how dire the news is that Ranok's bringing, the chief might need to summon one. If that happens, regardless of the original reason, the elders can present unrelated matters to be addressed by the gathered and steal the proceed in their way. You mean they can hijack it? I shudder at the realisation and similarly embrace myself. Fuck. Do you think they're planning it? Why else they got the dirt, dirt left, right and centre? He shrugs and I nod, my heart slightly sinking. True. You're heading to the villa, I assume? The wolf has sighed and I raise my brow. Huh? Where well, else will you get the rest of the ingredients? I was planning to, but now I don't know. I mumble, looking around concerned. This whole thing might have been a bad idea. Well, you have to go now. Oh yeah? Why? Because we didn't go through all this bullshit for you to suddenly back out. He sneers mockingly. Ranak will appreciate the meal. He's enjoying what the only good to come out of this whole debacle. I'm not convinced and look at him inquisitively. Besides, I need a favour. Send Triss to me. Tell him this. Full sundown, come. He again mimics a Neanderthal speech and I nearly laugh into his muzzle. Oh, it's not funny. He will understand. Oh, don't worry. I'll make sure he does. I smile, giving him a slightly worried look. What do you need Trist for? But he's in the fastest bugs in the forest. Want a message to reach Val quickly? It has to be done by one of them. I also don't want the others to catch wind of this. Oh, okay, I'll let him know. I nod and proceed towards the doors where his paw lands on my shoulder and squeezes slightly. Oh, for fuck's sake, Piglet, be careful. I will. I nod and leave, carrying my basket towards the Sylvan Road. At first I was brushing off those two old fats who was nothing more than a comic relief or a distraction. At worst they were just the typical entitled boomers who used their familiar, familial relations to blackmail everyone into tolerance of their racist outdated views. But now it seems they're more than just bigoted mouthpieces. They have real sway and when it comes to politics that's dangerous. Dangerous to make Vol completely messed up by fear. I seriously don't know where I woke up to. Wherever this is, I intend to see it through no matter what. Ranok, Verissa, Cora, even Vol, despite him not openly admitting that, risked their lives for me. For what's right? Triss was right. The young ones are different, and they seem to be the only hope for this tribe to move forward. Not even tribe, the entire forest. A chuckle reminded what Varok said. The human can tip the scales. At first I didn't want anything to do with any scales. But now, seeing that whether I like it or not, mine and everyone else's life hangs in the balance, I'm not going to simply sit by and watch the chips fall where they may. As dismissive as the wolves are of the Sylvan folk, I think I could be the bridge to gap this divide. And if I play my cards right, I might tip the scales in Ranok's favour. In any case, Dran and Aldris ended up on my shit list, and I'll do everything in my power to undermine their position, just as they do everything they can to undermine Ranok's and his father's. I'm just a dumb ape in their eyes, so the irony of such a twist will be this much sweeter. When I reach the road branching out towards the villa, I take a moment to calm myself down. I rest against one of the pillars marking the perimeter and take deep, slow breaths. Triss is quite easy to freak out if he senses danger. I cannot let him myself appear rattled when talking with him. I need him on board. I walk through the front garden, met with the now familiar architecture. I spot two bunnies going about the greenery. 
The closest to me is almost a yellowish female, cliffing the hedges. The other one, much further in the back, is a plucky grey male, quite massive for a bunny and not just in the waistline. He's huge, easy as twice the size of Trist. Guess they come in all shapes and sizes. The large male notices my gawk and stops brushing the pathway, pointing to his companion who's dead set on getting the room of the hedge right. Yo, Leaf! He calls out. There's a weirdo behind you, it's staring all creepy like. By the wild, it scared the crap out of me. The female nearly drops her clippers, grabbing them at the last moment and holding tight as one would hold a dagger. I'm not sure if she intends to use it to defend herself or it's just a natural reaction of being startled. So I decide to raise my hands in a calming manner. I show I have no weapon. The female rolls her eyes in annoyance. Oh, great. Someone misplaced a freak. You, a vacant face, what you want? She speaks of that now from the Neanderthal speech. This will never stop being annoying. Trist. I utter plainly, trying to give away that I can understand them. The girl blinks, almost if it was the last name she'd expect to hear. Trist? The fuck you want with Trist? Oi, Bramble, the freak wants to speak with Trist. She calls out to her chubby friend and the giant scoffs in amusement. Trist, I'll be the first. I also say Trist wants to speak with it. I don't know, this one's kind of fancy looking. She waves her clippers in my direction. I feel rather uncomfortable having her sharp blade aimed at me so casually. When I want to piss her off, or if his leash is attached to the end of that collar. Ah, oh, let me fetch him. Or if it's some kind of stupid prank, you'll be taking the heat. The other bunny grumbles and finally slips into the side doorway, leading to the kitchens, if I recall my previous tour of the place correctly. Yeah, yeah. At least you're not saddled with a freak. The female huffs and returns and tending the hedges. I have nothing else to do, I simply hang around, watching her work from time to time. She's oddly diligent, making sure the edge is just right. I'm not sure why. The chief doesn't seem like the sort that would be this bothered. What are you looking at, vacant face? She sneers in my direction. I can't help but chuckle and how flustered I make her. This seems only to fuel her annoyance. She finally straightens up. Oh, it's funny, is it? I want to take this trimmer and shove it so far up your... Hey, Leaf, what's up? Trist's arrival prevents any possible spat, and I smile at the bunny kindly. This freaking weirdo is up, up and about. Oh, it's fine. Here's Rannoch's new ward. Rannoch. The female gives me another, this time more careful look, and her eyes centre on my collar. Oh, that no good flea back. She calls out, shaking her oversized scissors. If I were you, I'd throw his new chew toy down the cesspool and... That's enough, Leaf. Now I'm the one to blink, taken by surprise by Trist's commanding tone. After the way he dismissed you, you've done nothing wrong and... I said enough. He repeats sternly, the girls are confused as shocked as I am. Didn't know Trist had this in him. What you're worried about? He's just a dumb oaf. We can speak freely. I won't repeat myself, Leaf. I think you've got some work to do. What's up with you, Grouchy? I was only having a bit of fun. Well, I'm in no mood. Now get back to work for you and yourself two additional hours in the scullery. The scullery? Leaf calls out in complete outrage. Who do you think you are? You're still yapping. Make it three hours if I hear another word. And with that threat, she finally goes quiet, although her mouth is still wide open. Damn, I guess Triss is not just anybody around here. It's quite bossy, not that it's any surprise. In retrospect, it does make sense. Once Leaf's surprise subsides, the female leaves us, marching in a rather aggravated fashion towards the other end of the garden. Come, let's get into the Paris style so we're more shielded from the prying eyes. He invites me to follow and move to the side, where the nice colonnade and roofing covers the path adjacent to the kitchen's wall. Uh, here should be good enough. Triss nods with satisfaction after his ears did a nice radar like sweet full cardinal directions. I see you bossing everyone around. I mutter in amusement, causing him to shrug. I had a bunch of rabbits without a warren. They need some semblance of hierarchy, otherwise all goes to shit. Besides, it's organised with just an easier prey for those wolves. <laughs> Spoken like a true leader. 
Tris puts a hand on my shoulder and leans out, looking at Leaf staring us down from afar. Try whispering and exaggerate your gestures a bit, so it looks like you're struggling to communicate with me. Can we just go somewhere secluded? I have to look even more suspicious. I guess. I nod reluctantly. Something's telling me he's just been careful not to appear in cahoots with me. Whatever the case, I'm not going to be difficult, so I decide to pull off my best Italian hand impersonation. A good enough? I ask, clap my hands around like a politician at a rally. Uh, yeah, tone it down a little. He grimaces teasingly. Shittiest spy actor this side of the world. Never claimed to be either. Or oh, the best one, if this is just a ruse. I roll my eyes, even though it's obvious his tone is playful. He casts another careful gaze towards his friend, decided to do the same, but the female is hard at work. Hope she didn't mistreat you. Despite her name, she's more like a thorn, very keen to prick. I chuckle his words and shrug. Perhaps a little, but I'm happy to forget about it. After all, I know what you guys go through, and it lies it's not personal. It's just misplaced anger. He smiles, nodding. Uh, she's a good person at heart, but being in our situation, that heart has to be pretty well fortified. What are you doing here anyway? No one sent for you. I know, but I'm running an errand for, well, Rannoch. He's not back yet, not until the evening at least. He narrows his eyes, getting slightly wary. Well, that's the thing, I want to cook something for him as a welcoming gift. Ha! You're up in your ward game. Trist finally laughs, giving me one of his more genuine smiles. I guess I can now understand why I got the boot. It's not funny, not to me at least. I mumble awkwardly, not keen to revisit the subject every time we meet. I really am sorry about that. A oh, dude, I'm the one who got kicked out. Don't be sorry on my behalf, okay? Then Abbey pats my shoulder energetically and I have to concede. You're right. So, what do you need? I need broth, mustard, sage and some dried apples. He listens carefully as I try to recall the ingredients, his expression shifting from confusion to a very mocking smirk. Oh, I thought you wanted to welcome him home. If you want to kill the wolf, just brew him some wolf spain and be done with it. Yeah, no. I chuckle, get thrown off immediately by how quickly he mentioned the poisonous plant. Wait, what? It's a joke. Trist reassures me, laughing at my bewildered expression and quickly dismisses the, dismisses the whole exchange. Broth will be easy, we'll just cook some beef, there's plenty around in the vats. Sage, apples and mustard should be in the pantry, anything else? Some cream? Yeah, all doable. I'll take you to the kitchens, but the pantry you'll have to visit yourself. I don't want to be caught going through the stores. What? Why? The housekeeper's going through the stock and he's been up in my business all morning, I... He pauses awkwardly, looking around while his ears scan the opposite directions. I have a bad history with him. There were some discrepancies about the smoking leaf and uh, wine. Trist, you rascal. Did they give for a pincher? I laugh, but he doesn't find it funny. I am not. The chief and fifth have probably had another binger, smoking and drinking when completely hammered and simply forgot. But since I got the boot, all eyes are on me. Again, sorry about that. Never mind that. He rolls his eyes, clearly annoyed with my continuous apologies. You steal the pantry on your own. You can use the servant passage. They won't even know you're there. Will you wait for me just in case there'll be trouble? Why would there be trouble? Again, he looks at me with slight suspicion. You aren't stealing those, are you? Oh, no. But I had a running with Aldris and Ran in the village. They kind of wolf-handled me a little. I show my bruises and he grimaces uncomfortably. If it wasn't for Cora, I don't know what would have happened. Really? They must be getting antsy if they harass you in the open. But don't you worry about the elders. They don't show their muzzles around here since our luncheon. They stay clear of the villa. He smiles over my shoulder reassuringly. But I don't find that comforting. Yeah, but that means they're running rampant in the village. Oh, don't worry. No one will harass you here. What about the housekeeper? Oh, he wouldn't dare to harass you while you're wearing that. He pokes at the poor emblem on my collar. I just have a regular one. He didn't even look at me when I served Rannoch. With his crest, you're pa practically untouchable. Um, that's disputable. I mutter again, petting my sore arms. Okay, tell you what, I'll wait at the door while you fetch your stuff. In case there's trouble, I'll be able to intervene. He states with an encouraging smile and nod in agreement. Thanks, that'll be quite a comfort. 
Good. While we're inside, I'll zip it. I cut him to the punchline, the bunny laughs. Once he leads me into the kitchen, a sprawling vaulted room greets me with two massive hearths on one side. There are many tables and counters, piled high with containers, pans and pots, along with various raw and cooked dishes. Three bunnies are working the fires, each minding their own station while Bramble sits on the far end eating carrot. I can smell some stew boiling, along with the scent of roasted meat and what seems to be a pastry in the oven. It's a very busy workplace, quite not considering only the chief lives here. Then again, I don't think his belly came out of nowhere. The wolf likes to eat well. Hey, Bramble, can you fetch me some cream and broth? I'd say a small file of both will suffice. Tris looks to me for confirmation and I nod. The large bunny grimaces in my direction and walks towards one of the dressers. As he does so, Tris leads me towards a small door and cracks it open. This will take you directly to the pantry. Don't take any side doors, just go straight ahead. He whispers an instruction and again I nod in silence. Why are you letting that creep into the villa? Mind your own business, I'll have you clean the cloaca for the next week. I hear Triss war as the doors close behind me. The dimly lit corridor is quite windy. I can see three sets of doors to my left, most likely leading to various parts of the complex. I spot the door on the far end, one behind which I should find the pantry. I, start, I try to tread quietly as I slink towards the other side. Once the doors creak, I find myself in the familiar room. Damn, this place is full of surprises. I can hear the chatter in the main hall, with his warm voice muttering something of the gloomy sound in chief. Cora did mention they having quite a binger recently, empowered by what Triss told me about missing supplies. Keenly aware that being caught rummaging to the pantry would not be a good look, especially after the altercation on the street, I decided to go quickly about my business. If only any of these damn containers were labelled, we'd be out of here in no time. I open and clink shut the lids in haste, trying to find what I need. I recall where Trist had me fetch the ingredients to the punch, and quite soon I stumbled upon dried fruits. Oranges, peaches, I think, pears, apples. One down, two to go. Must it all be a no-brainer, and I don't know what sage should look like. I have a strong enough recollection of what stuff in smells like to be able to find the herb, regardless of its form. Nope, not this one. Nope. I cast a curious gaze towards the door, hearing the muffled conversation, but I decided to keep focused on my task. Nope, another jar filled with unknown liquid. What's this? I flipped the lid over to shut it just as fast. Yuck, what the fuck is this godforsaken concoction? It smells like rotten fish. Just kill me if you're going to feed this to me. Stuff of nightmares should not have a place in the pantry. Nope, nope, nope. Not here, not in this one. And this one. Bingo. Mustard. Oof, about the smell of it, the strong kind. So it comes down to sage. As I run through the shelves, I cannot help but overhear their oddly hushed voices. As much as I want to be out of here, I decide to have a quick peek. I approach the doors and push them ever so gently, I have a slither of a glimpse into this great hall. The chief and Vithas sit at their usual spots, drinking wine and talking away. They seem to be quite inebriated, judging by their sluggish speech and very ungraceful movements. Oh, I love that boy with all my heart. It's all I got left. It reminds me so much of her. Ah, she's gone, friend. Can't keep wasting money trying to track her down. Rannoch's mother? She's not dead. Well, sometimes I think it was all a mistake. Ah, I should have left with her. It is what any wolf should. You put the tribe of her personal wants. Oh, what for? His voice is strained, almost breaking. You would have done a better job than I. You would have been a great chief. I ain't a chief. With a state stern, he filling up his cup. No one I ever be. You had the blood right in the spawn of the howl. Fuck the howl. Oh, fuck the blood right. I'm so tired of these politics. The old male sneers, taking a deep gulp of wine. You would have been a coward to leave after what you'd done. You would have sent the tribe to chaos and anarchy. Why is it bad that at times I don't care? I don't say such things. Well, I miss her, Vitha. I see her in my dreams. I see her in his eyes. She haunts me. Ah, oh, stop it. The brown wolf commands in a stern voice. The chief seems to not mind. I don't even know if she's alive. 
You need to focus on your son. Ron needs you. If you tore them so much, you need to let it go and protect a legacy. Your legacy. I'm into that. Whatever happened. Ronak needs you, old man. Well, sometimes I envy you. The chief speaks, causing Vitha's expression to sour immediately, and he locks his angered gaze with the older male. Ah, don't. Well, you don't have to wonder. You know where she is. Oh, she's six feet under. I jump back as Vitha slammed his cup into the table, splashing wine all around. What consolation is that? Tell me. You can visit her. Speak to her lizard the rustle of her leaves. You're fucking drunk. The brown male sneers, turning his back to his friend. Am I not right, though? I've always been a spot brat. Nothing was ever enough for you. He speaks slowly, his voice betraying a hint of resentment I've never seen before. Then finally he faces Varrock again, his muzzle barely containing a snarl. I gladly trade places. I used to know that Limoel is still alive. He would not with me. He could have with another wolf. His eyes gloss, and I see a tear trickle down his cheek. I'm glad he's suffered the separation. Oh, no, no, she's still graced the world with it. laughter. You think you're the only one suffering? Vither locks his teary gaze with his paws. Putting his grief on full display, even I feel slightly choked up. I see her chorus bustle every moment that day. She's a spitting image, almost as if a Ludo had taunted me. So Cor and Ranok are the gleam in their father's eyes because they're reminders of a lost loved one. This explains why their relationship deviates so much from the customary norm around here. That's not her loan is doing. I don't have the moon. The chief subdues a growl. They both took the, both of our loved ones. They took them both. I have a nasty feeling he means the elders, which if true would explain the rift between them. I know, you're right. That's why we must not let them win. They must pay. We have to be smart about this. They cannot be allowed to hurt our pups. With the places poor on Varrock's shoulder, the male brushes it off. Oh, I'll set that bitch's throat before she lays her poor on Varrock. Oh, Cora. She thinks that little investigation is meant to intimidate her. She has another thing coming. It is Aldris, then. We owe it to our mates. I think I've heard enough. I back out from the door and quickly glance around the room. I need to get out of here, especially after hearing this. If I were a sage, where would I be? Better yet, if I were a bunny stocking sage, where would I put it? Somewhere within arm's reach. I scan the middle shelves once again and locate the few containers I haven't checked. One by one I narrow it down to the last two, and just like that, the last but not least holds the crushed leaves that smell like Christmas. Sage. Right, time to exit stage left. Though in my case, the doors are on the right. As I rush through the corridor, I see Trist waving me in. Once I'm inside the, once inside the kitchen, he closes the doors behind me, giving me quite a suspicious look. Have your broth and cream. He mutters, nodding towards the table. I quickly deposit the two files into my basket. I let him lead me out of the room, eager to get away from the prying eyes. Once outside, he glares at me impatiently, almost as if he thought I'd put him on the spot. What took you so long? Well, first I needed to find the sage, but then I can't call eavesdroppy. I admit uncomfortably, but not, not seeing a point of lying to him. My frankness takes him by surprise and he blinks, embracing me slightly and levelling with my line of sight. What? Why? What did you overhear? Nothing important, really. Just a private conversation between the chief and Vitha. It seems so sad. Yeah, well, they've been sulking ever since I got here, but lately it got increasingly worse. It's about their wives, isn't it? It's not even a question. He states if it's an obvious role to see. Wolves don't have wives. I might have taken by his comment. What? Of course they do. I mean, most don't. He shrugs. It's kind of complicated with them. Normally wolves don't get attract, attached to their mates. However, when they do, they call it a soul bond. Well, I understood, both the chief and Vitha had that special connection with their mates. Rhinox and Cora's mothers, I conclude. Yeah. No wonder they're so keen on the idea of their kids becoming a thing. 
probably romantically poetic them in some twisted way. He tries to laugh it off. My heart sings the realisation of the harsh truth. Well, isn't it? Kinda. I mumble uncomfortably. If they only knew it was all just a ruse, they'd have been completely broken. I guess. Tris concedes indifferently, but I can't help but linger on the matter. I can't imagine the disappointment it'll fall apart. No way. He weighs at me dismissively. Rannock and Cora are very keen on each other. They're practically like conjoined twins. Oh yeah, you're right. I laugh, trying to conceal that I know more than I perhaps should. I was thinking about what ifs, you know, when I told you a curveball and then... Ah, those two are solid as a rock. Thankfully he doesn't pick up on it and dismisses my comments as paranoia. Yeah, I guess you're right. I'm just projecting my pessimism. Anyway, I'm going to get those back to the cottage. Up onto the basket. I have some experimental cooking to attempt. More like attempted murder. Triss laughs mockingly and I scowl. Again? Ugh. What did apples ever do to you? Fuck you, Trist. Oh, I'd fuck me, all right. He smiles widely, his chopper's on full prideful display. He's actually quite good looking without his stink eye. Afraid I can't say the same about you, buddy. Too bad he doesn't have a personality to match his exterior. I shake my head teasingly and take a deep sigh, where I'm reminded of the message from Vul. Oh, one last thing. Hmm? Vulgar needs to see you at sundown. Vulgar? He jumps up in a panic and looks around. Why, what did I do? Relax, you've done nothing. I chuckle encouragingly. He just needs a favour. Go to his cottage, but do so discreetly so no, no one else notices. Is this one of your stupid ideas? He mutters accusingly, but I shake my head. No, he just needs you to get a message to his grandmother. There's trouble brewing with his two old cunts. He just wants to be prepared in case they make a move. Ah, that's different. If I can help you fuck over those two in any fashion, I'll gladly do it. Triss laughs merrily, patting my side. Does he know we? He pauses, darting his finger between himself and me. No, I kept my word. He still thinks we're on pantomime level. Good. The bunny nods in content. Keep it that way. In case things go south, I'd rather not have a direct connection to you. Sure, I get it. Getting up towards my filled basket. I think we've been out in the open for long enough. Anyway, take care, Tris. I've got dinner to make. I nod to him and head towards the path. Yeah, good luck with that. He calls out through subdued laughter. Looking forward to your execution tomorrow for crimes against wolfkind and culinary arts. I walk off, flipping the birds as I do so. Not that I expect him to even get the gesture. Despite my perilous situation, I found myself to be in a position where I both overlooked and underestimated, I can prove quite useful. As much as I hate to admit it, I'd make quite a good spy. Especially when surrounded by racists with a superiority complex. But I could utilise this skill against those old fools. But there's no rush. As Anel said herself, a true wolf lies in wait for the right moment to strike. And so I'll wait patiently. Something will come up, I'm certain of it. Until then, I just need to survive. I find it quite unsettling those two cunts had a hand in both Rannox and Cora's mother's disappearance. What I understood, Cora's mom died because of them, somehow. While Rannox's mom left, apparently hoping for Varrock to follow her, but he chose to stay instead. Was she banished? If so, for what possible reason? Sure not because she hanged around over for a while when Rannock was little. That's not a crime, is it? This is all so convoluted, it gives me more and more reason to hate those abusive pieces of shit. They've been fucking up everyone's life here for generations, it would seem. Hey! Not now. I'm angry enough as it is. I rub my bruises, suddenly met with the realisation. If Rannock's returning tonight, then this will send him into a frenzy. Fuck. I'll have to come up with some lame-ass excuse to cover for those geezers. We'll have to play it down and play it cool as if we'd get those cunts, and Rannock isn't exactly known for his subtlety. As I entered the village, I walked directly towards the butchery. I passed the onlookers who still relived the spectacle from the morning, staring at me with utter disbelief. Went to the counter, I poked it, drawing Vol's attention. This, we sparred, Rannock cannot know. He looks at me with confusion, but quickly nods, hopefully understanding my meaning. Trist will come around sundown. Again, Vol nods and I rush off, acutely aware of one's locking their curious gazes at us. So I walked down the last stretch of the road leading to the cottage, I noticed the white wolf standing on the side of the pathway. Fuck. He's the last person I need to interact with now. 
For a moment I consider finding the detour, but it's too late. He approaches me calmly and grabs the handle of my heavy basket. Oh, let me help you. I try to protest, but he persists, tugging at the handle. Considering that further resistance would only cause another scene, I simply let go and allow him to take it from me. Oh, well, fancy seeing you here. And by that, I mean you look quite fancy in that silk dress. He winks at me mockingly, barely containing the snicker. Rannoch treats you well. Instead of an attendant, you almost look like a bride. I choke on that remark and throw him a shocked stare, causing the wolf to laugh. Oh, come now. Ruffling your fur is not even a challenge. It was only teasing. I keep my head straight, looking at the distance if I didn't even hear him. I feared you had quite an eventful day. You're the talk of the town. He bumps into my shoulder. The only people who ever reached this level of notoriety around you never got to enjoy it for long. Their heads get too big for their own good and roll off their shoulders. Is that meant to be a threat? Uh, still silent, I see. Oh, I guess Rannoch's choice in wards was always a little bit peculiar. In spite of his penetrating stare, I feel more anxious than I should, if another set of eyes kept drilling into me. I look back and see the same hooded figure in the distance. I recognise him. That wolf's been following my every move around the village in the past few days. My heart races and Tano's eyes centre on me, clearly picking up on my distress. He wastes no time and locates the cause of my sudden anxiety. Uh, that's Andalt. And you're right to be afraid. He's a bit of a creep, even by my standards. The white wolf utters in an oddly comforting tone. I'd advise you to stay away from him, and I mean that with complete sincerity. I looked at him with a slightly risen brow. Yes, I know they told you the same about me, but trust me, Arnold was always a little unhinged, and since our shaman passed away, he has been acting out more than usual. Also, he has it out for Verissa, so if I were you, I'd keep my affiliation with her on the down low and have my wits about me. I narrow my eyes, clear distrust painted across my face. Oh, it's not a trap, kid. If I wanted you harmed, I'd already rat you out for speaking our language and faking your injury. I cannot hide my shock at his bluntness. Oh, don't act so surprised. Surely you knew I knew. You're not a good actor. Uh, your mute performance grows weary. I can see I pretty much exhausted his patience he decided to drop my act. I've already pretty much called my bluff to my face, and aggravating him further only worsens my situation. What do you want? Tano feigns an exaggerated gasp. It speaks! Uh, sorry, I couldn't help it. He chuckles it off. Stop fucking around, you can get me killed. Oh, relax, if I wanted you killed, you'd be dead already. I want you to stay safe. Our people really don't need another distraction right now. Well, it's too late for that. My safety depended on staying away from you. Look at how that worked out. Your secret is safe with me, not on your account, but the tribes. I pull away from him slightly, not buying into his pretty words. He fooled me once already. He notices my distrust and sighs. My goals simply differ from Rannox. That does not make me evil. Maybe it does make you an enemy. The white wolf gazes at me with slight surprise. That's a bit rash, don't you think? I raise my brow. There's a say, choose your allies wisely and your enemies more careful still. Believe me when I say this, you don't want me as your enemy. Well, you're no ally either. Which makes me impartial, and that can be a whole deal more effective in solving your current predicament. He states plainly, my defined expression causes him to sigh. A fresh perspective devoid of any emotional biases might prove quite handy. What makes you think they're emotionally invested in me? Huh, who's trying to be deceitful now? I'm another kid illegally smuggled into your village. Why would you care about me? I don't. He shrugs indifferently. True, it is worrisome you speak our language, just as curious as your time, the appearance here in the first place. But I'm willing to believe you and your amnesia story. Oh, and why is that? Again, you're not a good liar. The white wolf sighs, spain his arms in defeat. And as much as I hate to admit it, Rannoch is a good judge of character. If he says you're harmless, I'm willing to trust his instincts. Besides, we have bigger problems to deal with, and I really wouldn't like the Howl or the Elders wasting what precious little time we have left on this 
distraction. He brushes his paw dismissively in my direction. So I would like for us to come to an understanding. You will lay low, much, much lower than you did so far. And in turn, I will make sure the more perceptive eyes of our tribe are fixed elsewhere. And I am supposed to trust you? Well, as I said, I already have you in my paws. There is no trap here to be sprung. Do you have a habit of rolling in grass? Yes, casually throwing me off. What? There seems to be another weed stuck in your pin. I thought I got rid of the last one. I stop in my tracks, looking in wide eyes as he goes to try some, as he tries to reach my dandelion. I swat his paw away the last moment. It was you. I nearly exclaimed, which he smiles with sadistic satisfaction. Temper, temper, someone might take notice. He looks around, causing me to do the same. Although no one's around to base any mind, I need to keep my cool. I take a deep breath, locking my hateful gaze in the distance. I cannot look at this fucker right now. Did it upset him? Oh, I bet it did. Yet is in a sad tone, but smirk betrays he's faking it. I want to wipe off his smug muzzle. If we weren't in the open, I would. Oh, come now, don't make threats you know you cannot follow through. He laughs me off and I throw him in an angered stare. Don't test me. The white wolf only nods towards his chiseled torso. Even if he's the smallest of the wolves, I'd have no chance with him. I sigh in annoyance, trying to yank the basket free where his hold remains firm. Now, be a good servant, go in there and make our future chief happy. Uh, don't worry, everything will be fine as long as you follow our lead. Our lead? A mine and theirs. Whatever crazy scheme Varys and the gang cooked up to be rid of you, make sure it works. I will hold my peace. But if you fuck up again as you did with me, I will not hesitate to sell you out just to mitigate the damage. He says in a cold tone, I'm not quite sure what to make of it. I'm just glad to see Rom is at the cottage. Oh, and one last thing. I say you keep out of the exchange and its conclusion just between us. Rannock and I are not exactly on speaking terms. He might take it the wrong way and overreact as he usually does. That would not be helpful to either of us. I hope my little demonstration of the feast proved what I mean. I hardly contain my anger at his smugness. You almost blew our cover. Uh, yeah, almost. Lucky I did so when everyone was at their most distracted and the chief was away, huh? Fuck, he's smart. And evil. Believe me, I had you where I wanted you and no harm came your way. He winks at me coyly, I'm mainly unconvinced, looking at him with suspicion. My resolve strengthens by the fact we finally arrived home. You're smarter than you give yourself credit. You should know by now I'm not a threat. Well, not actively, at least. You know what to do. And by now I've had enough of his bluster and veiled threats. I give him the meanest stink I can possibly muster and rush up the stairs of the porch. I enter the kitchen and slam the doors behind me, slumping against them. What a prick. He's so full of himself that all I can think of is wiping that self satisfied smirk from his smug muzzle. Ah, but he's right. I mumble, plopping the basket onto the floor. Rannock tends to overreact, and as much as I don't feel like having secrets, I don't think telling him I spoke with Tanner would be a good idea. Not only could lead to another scene, and I've had my fill for the week, it could potentially derail our reunion. As salvage as it sounds, I really need to have some closure with him. It would be exceedingly hard to talk about our feelings when he's fuming over the white wolf. Fuck. Why does everything have to be so complicated? I look around the cottage with resignation, remembering how desperate I was to get out from these four walls. Now all I can think of is barricading myself in here and never coming out. I begin slowly unpacking all of my bounty, arranging it neatly onto the table. Once I put away the basket, I work on the fire, getting it nice and hot. I look towards the window, trying to gauge the time of day. Sometime past noon, I suppose. For what Varissa said, this probably wouldn't take longer than an hour to prepare, so it might be too early for that. I guess Rank won't be back until six o'clock or so. I have time to kill. Between the idle browse and the of Aves' guide, I set up the dried apple slices to soak and brew myself some mint in hot water. There's no tea nor coffee to indulge in, so herbs are the only alternative to the water that isn't boozy. The mint helps me calm down a bit, as despite appearances, the encounter of the elders did rattle me a little. 
not to mention Vol's poor ass handling of his own emotions. It was curious to see him project his fear into anger. Curious, but also unsettling. I don't think I could, I could have imagined the male to be scared of anything. I guess scared is the wrong word. He's worried for his friends and himself. Still, as dismissive as I am of those old farts, they have more pull around you than I'd like to admit. Hopefully this little scuffle will slide by the sideway, but something tells me it's not going to happen. I could use some company to distract myself from worries, but as Rissa said, everyone's prepared to welcome the missing pack. I wish I could help, but I suppose it's better I stay out of sight for a while. The only consolation is the fact I'll attend tonight's feast. That's definitely something I look forward to. As the blue sky outside slowly fades into hues of vibrant pinks and purples, I begin to set up my cooking station. I place a metal grate on top of the frame hold in the wood, creating an improvised stove. Following Varissa's instructions, I grab a skillet and melt a dollop of butter. Drain the apple slices, I drop them into the pan and fry until they're golden brown. The aroma is very reminiscent of an apple pie, and instantly lifts up my mood, causing a wide smile on my face. Damn, this smells good. Once the apples are done, the butter is slightly caramelised, I remove them onto a side plate. Gently I take the four succulent pork fillets and drop them into the pan. They sizzle immediately, releasing pink juices into the butter, and the smell intensifies, shifting slightly from an apple pie towards a sweet barbecue. Mmm. This starts to make me hungry. I make sure to see the medallions evenly, including the edges, to trap as much of the juices inside as possible. No one likes dried meat. Okay, what was next? Add back the apples and pour in the broth. I follow the instruction covering the fillets in stock, watching with satisfaction as it bubbles. Now a spoon of mustard and some sage. I fish out a generous dollop of the mustard, again enjoying its potent scent. This could go very well with the sausages. Mmm, I could devour a nice dog. I blink, laughing and shaking my head. Don't say that in front of the wolves, you weirdo. I open a little container with sage, wondering how much would be enough. I guess a generous sprinkling should do the trick. I shrug, pepper in the stew with a crushed up herb, till that familiar scent of Christmas turkey stuff and fills the house. Now that the dish simmers, I sit back and relax, enjoying the darkening sky outside, accompanied by a smell of absolutely culinary delight. This wasn't as hard as I imagined. My hand taps impatiently the table as the minutes go by, increasingly aware of Ranok's imminent return. God, I'm so impatient. I get up to stir the bubbling sauce, looking at how lovely everything is incorporated. Once I think it's just right, I finally add the cream. I bring a spoon to my lips and take a curious sip. Damn, this is delicious. A perfect combination of savoury and sweet. The apples and the mustard are balanced so well with the buttery flavour of cream. No wonder it's one of his favourites. I think it's mine as well. As I revel in my culinary triumph, I hear heavy footsteps approach the doorway and my heart skips a beat. He's here. I try to hold in the tears, my, my, my eyes are already glossed. The doors crack open, I see my wolf enter with an excited but slightly surprised expression. Oh, Sam? Rannock. I run through my trembling lips, still not believing he's really here, safe and unharmed. But I'm willing to cause a scene, I must draw my strength, simply say the words I've been wanting to say for a long while. Welcome home. See, Radok is back. Well, that's the end of the update. <laughs> well, I hope you enjoyed that one, and I think that recipe is actually worth trying. Sounds pretty good. I actually do uh, pork chops with apples, onions, and cooked in cider myself. And that's very good, so this one is definitely worth trying. There we go, that is far beyond the world for this update. And before I do anything else, I should give a mention to Bastian, Marcus, Brian Hall, Gunnar Muller, Cindy Dragowolf, Rusty Alvarado, Tiger Cub, Ida Corval, Anubis Silverwind, Brandon Bradford, Dissonance, Sumuto, The Beholder, David Taylor, Evan King and Grizz who are my top patrons. So my patron stuff is down the, in the description, so is Kale's. He'd like to support Far Beyond the World. You can certainly do that, Ed, and uh, don't forget to join the Discord as well. 
Always a lot of fun going on there. And there we go. Tomorrow is Tennis Ace. And this one actually, actually this video will be going up slightly later than I planned. I'm looking at the time and I have to go out for a dinner appointment very soon. So this uh, will be going up quite late in the uh, evening here. Sorry about that. But there will be a Tennis Ace tomorrow, as I promised during the last uh, Tennis Ace video. So I hope you enjoy that. And it's another mystery video coming up next weekend. I'm not quite sure what I'm going to do yet. But we'll see there. And there's the Luna. I think that's a good point for us to end here. As usual, thanks for watching. Until next time, bye for now.